So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Alex Tarantino. I'm PDI's Kent County Vice President and Chair of the Education Committee. I want to welcome you all to the first webinar in our 2023 Historic Preservation Webinar Series. It's called Historic Graffiti at Old Swedes Church and Other Delaware Sites, presented by Michael Emmons, who's PDI's Vice President for Newcastle County. So thanks, Michael, for being here. And thanks also to Tetra Tech, our 2023 webinar series sponsor. And before I hand it off to Michael, I just want to give everyone a few reminders about Zoom. So all attendees are muted. So we ask that if you have a question that you use the Q&A function that's located at the bottom of your screen. And don't worry if your question isn't answered right away. We are keeping track of all questions and comments received, and we'll have time after Michael's presentation um, for questions. You can also use the chat box to get in touch with us if you're having technical difficulties, and we'll post links and other material in there for you all to view as well. We are recording this workshop, and it'll be available um, in a week or two on Preservation Delaware's website and our YouTube channel. And lastly, if you aren't already a member of PDI, I wanna invite you to please consider joining and supporting us. Um, your support helps keep events like this one free and we'll post more info in the chat about that as well. So lastly, before I introduce Michael, um, Michael, next slide real quick, thank you. I wanted to invite everybody to our next free webinar that's scheduled for June 27th at 6.30 p.m. It's called, Is This Original? Tips for Investigating Historic Architecture. So this webinar is gonna be presented by Kara Smith, who's an associate at John Milner Architects, and she specializes in historic preservation. And the webinar is intended for historic property owners or preservation enthusiasts who want to learn how architectural clues can help establish a building's original appearance, identify changes over time, inform the, and inform the restoration process. So we'll share the link to register for that webinar in the chat. And without further ado, I want to introduce our presenter tonight. Michael Emmons is an architectural historian and the assistant director at the Center for Historic Architecture and Design at the University of Delaware, which is a research unit that engages in historic preservation projects throughout the Mid-Atlantic and beyond. He also teaches in the Historic Preservation Program at UD's Biden School of Public Policy and Administration, including one of the program's core courses, Theory and Practice. Welcome, Michael, and thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Alex, for that introduction. Can you hear me okay? I'm really looking forward to this, this next webinar next month. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. I always love having an opportunity to talk about historic graffiti. It's a topic that I can talk about for hours, but I'll try to cram into just one hour tonight. So uh, a lot of people ask me how I began studying historic graffiti. And the short answer is, right now, it's it's my dissertation topic. It's my doctoral work. But my interest was probably peaked for the first time about 20 years ago when I was a master's student at the University of Connecticut, interning at Old Sturbridge Village up in Massachusetts. And while working there, I was made aware of some old writings and some markings in a couple of the historic buildings there. And I thought it was really fascinating that these buildings contained written traces of their former occupants. Soon afterwards, I continued to encounter old writing and carvings in historic buildings while I was a real estate agent uh, specializing in historic property sales in Connecticut. As you can imagine, I saw all kinds of cool things touring hundreds of old houses when I was doing that work. But it really wasn't until years later, when I returned to graduate school at the University of Delaware, that I got serious about studying this topic. At UD, I was a research, research assistant at the Center for Historic Architecture and Design, or CHAD, as Alex pointed out, um, where I'm assistant director now. Um, and as we documented a lot of dozens of old buildings in the Mid-Atlantic, I continued to see more and more of these historic inscriptions, markings, and graffiti. So climbing around all these old buildings, you start to really study the material fabric and you start to see all the little minutia that's left behind over time. Dozens of houses, barns, and other places continue to reveal such inscriptions and graffiti. So I decided to pursue a PhD in preservation studies and to study historic graffiti and inscriptions, um, which is what I'm focusing on for my dissertation. And my hope is to see what patterns would reveal themselves, but also to consider the preservation value of historic graffiti and markings. I've now documented thousands, literally, of historic graffiti at hundreds of buildings, mostly in the Northeastern United States. And my talk tonight will highlight a few of those graffiti and other markings just here in Delaware. So I want to start tonight by describing what I mean by historic graffiti. 
Of course, today, when we hear graffiti, we tend to think of spray paint covering up large swaths of alley walls, fences, or train cars with colorful, bulbous lettering. However, long before spray paint was invented, for millennia actually, humans have been writing things on the surfaces of buildings, sometimes with paint, but often by scratching. The word graffiti, in fact, derives from a Greek word, which means to write, and a later Italian word translating roughly to little scratchings or scribblings. The term graffiti was used as early as 1851, so a decade before the US Civil War, by archeologists who needed a word to describe the countless informal inscriptions that they were uncovering in the Roman city of Pompeii in modern day Italy, which was of course buried by a volcanic eruption 2000 years ago. The more recent American equivalent of these writings can be found on a huge number of historic buildings easily discoverable if we slow down and take a close look. When I use the term historic graffiti, I'm usually referencing the most common form I encounter, which is old writing on wood surfaces, usually scratched with a pen knife or a nail, but also sometimes written in pencil or another instrument. Whether on wooden doors, church pews, or barn doors, I've documented thousands of these wood scratchings across the East Coast of the United States and beyond. But sometimes when I say historic graffiti, I might also be invoking other marking types, including bricks carved with names, initials, and dates, old painted graffiti, etchings in glass windows created with diamonds or nails, stones carved or rubbed with words, and sometimes intriguing symbols and markings containing, um, uh, containing meanings not fully explained by historians. I'll touch on some of those in a little bit. So in short, my subject matter here tonight might simply be characterized as markings left by humans on old building and art buildings and architecture. So I'll start with Old Swedes Church in Wilmington, formerly known as Old Trinity Church, first built in 1699, which has attracted all sorts of inscription types over the centuries. And then I'll end with a, a less structured sort of show and tell of graffiti at other Delaware sites. The grounds of Old Swedes Church has proven to be a powerful magnet for textual marking. Though visitors are probably most attuned to the formal and sanctioned texts we encounter there, the building and its surrounding landscape are also marked with hundreds of less formal inscriptions, including graffiti, created across three centuries of the church's history. Tonight, I'll first examine one of the more intriguing and unique acts of inscription I've encountered in the Mid-Atlantic, the large, heavy iron letters that form a variety of dedications and inscriptive messages high on the stone walls of the church. Secondly, I'll touch on a significant number of large, hand-initialed stones that are also found on the walls of the church, which I call builder stones. I'll explain why in a few minutes. And then third, I'll consider the wooden south doors, which are heavily carved with historic graffiti. The volume and density of graffiti on these doors represents one of the most prolific examples of historic graffiti that I've encountered, and I have studied a lot of sites. As I mentioned, the markings at Old Swedes, though numerous, are not entirely unique. As I mentioned a minute ago, historic structures throughout the Eastern United States, in fact, feature a wide array of markings, date stones, inscriptions, builder's marks, signatures, hex signs, doodles, and all sorts of old graffiti. These markings collectively form a widespread and a fascinating class of art artifacts, the breadth of which has not really been explored in depth by historians. And that's why I chose the wide ranging study of historic graffiti for my doctoral work. Historic graffiti is fascinating, but they're also valuable historical documents, akin to archival sources, that both help us understand the buildings where they're found and the society in which they were made. Markings offer us the ability to read historic buildings as texts, sometimes literally, as with these date stones and inscriptions, but also in the archeological sense. Location and type of historic markings and their relationship to other markings and artifacts can shed light on how people related to their physical environment how people used buildings, and how these relationships changed over time. Markings and inscriptions represent and communicate a broad range of personal and cultural messages. Depending on the type, markings can demonstrate an awareness of time, as with date stones, signify rebellion and deviance, as with graffiti, convey instruction or direction, as with carpenter marks, indicate inclusion or belonging, express religious belief or superstition, recognize achievement, assert possession or ownership, commemorate or honor, and, as I argue, express an innate human need to leave a permanent mark in the world. Perhaps this is one of the things that is the most moving about encountering 200-year-old graffiti. As material culture historian Jules, uh, Jules David Prown observed, when we study historical objects, quote, we encounter the past at first hand. We have direct sensory experience of surviving historical events, 
I like this characterization because with historic graffiti, you can still lay eyes on a past historical event and imagine the living action of someone who likely passed on long ago. Historic writing in particular prompts instant curios curiosity in us and a perceived connection to specific actors from the past. Especially when markings are hand inscribed, freehand and vernacular in appearance, there's almost a palpable presence of another human being. In this way, historical actors who mark or sign buildings reach out to us over the space of time to reveal to us and to connect us to their worlds. So these markings are artifacts that can be poignant, fascinating, and even powerful when encountered by modern viewers. And they often represent visible, tangible, public expressions of human interiority. As such, when preserved, they enrich the historic buildings where they're found with a richness meaning, and meaning that cannot be replicated. For historians, I should also note, these historic graffiti and inscriptions are valuable as written documents, scarce and frag fragmentary as they may be. They leave records behind from groups of people sometimes not prevalent in other historical documents, like newspapers or deeds, wills, and probates. For some of the wall writers, the surviving graffiti may in fact be the only remaining trace of their lives in written form. There are, of course, significant challenges when evaluating graffiti as historical documents. First and foremost is the question of when exactly a marking was made. Even when a date or a year is inscribed on an object, the possibility remains that the marking is commemorative, unfinished, or intentionally misleading, rather than being a true record of an event. This slide shows the oldest date carved into the south doors at Old Swedes. Dated just a dozen years after the church building was finished, JA 1711 is cut into the bottom door on the southeast side of the building leaving us to wonder who J.A. is and why they carved up the door just 11 years after this new ch church was built. However, there is a problem. Evidence indicates that the current south doors were not installed in 1699, but in 1774, when the balcony stairs were built. At that time, the door openings were reconfigured, the matching pairs of doors were installed both upstairs and down, replacing the 75-year-old original doors. If this is the case, the door obviously could not have been carved in 1711. So how might we interpret this marking? Could this be an unfinished 1777? Was J.A. marking his or her birth year, which I have seen several times? Or was this carving a later prank? We may never know. And most graffiti lacks a date at all, so one can only speculate on a marking's age and the identity of its creator based on content and context especially when a person who marks a building is not the building's owner, whether a visitor, a former boarder, a family member, farm worker, or just a passerby, the documentary record rarely affords enough clues to determine the inscriber with certainty, especially when they only leave initials. That's not the case in cases like here, where a George Adams from Kingston, New York, who would have been of writing age in 1833, left a record of his visit to Old Swedes in April of that year. Even without such detailed information, Highly significant information can be gleaned with reasonable certainty by considering the content of markings, the available historical evidence, and established patterns and probability. At minimum, markings such as, th as those at Old Swedes reveal clues, hints, or taking off points, conceptual windows from which to explore the complex social, cultural, and physical environment in which a building was created and used. The first type of inscription I'd like to touch on at Old Swedes Church is, however, more formal, sanctioned by the leadership of the church and not handwritten, though they were made by hand. In 1699, as construction of Old Trinity Church was nearing completion, Eric Bjork, the first pastor, who was also oversaw the church's construction, christened every wall of the structure with large, heavy iron letters to form a variety of dedications and inscriptive messages. With these elaborate hand-forged iron letters and numbers, which would have taken countless hours to create, Bjork had his masons dedicate the church with meaningful, permanent messages on each exterior elevation of this building. Though many of the letters and numbers have since fallen off or disappeared, Bjork recorded the full inscriptions in his journal, allowing us an extraordinary uh, gl glimpse into these original architectural texts, which were in Latin. The north side read, Christ is our pole star. The east side said, light from on high shines in the darkness. On the south side, Emmanuel, or God is with us. And on the west elevation, at the main entrance, Bjork affixed what is practically an entire paragraph to his new building. 
translated, it asked, if God be for us, who can be against us? And then he dedicated the church, quote, in the reign of William III, by the grace of God, King of England, William Penn, proprietor, vice governor, William Markham, the most illustrious king, illustrious king of uh, the Swedes, Charles XI, now of most glorious memory, having sent here Ericus Tobias Bjork himself of Westmania, Pastor Loci. Bjork strongly wished these messages to be seen and contemplated. They were of substantial size, with letters ranging from four to six inches tall, and the original date numbers were even larger, and three quarters of an inch thick. What is not evident to us today, however, is their original color. The iron characters on the west wall, and perhaps the others, were painted red. Bjork notes in his journal that the mason's son, Joseph, worked before the consecration to wash the wall around the inscriptions and then, quote, colored the letters red so they, quote, might look better and more conspicuous. Clearly, even though even the st large stylish stone church made statements of its own, but Bjork wanted to direct the attention of the congregants, especially to his textual inscription. So why were these inscriptions so important to him? Bjork's dramatic textual demonstration expressed pride and optimism, to be certain, but the gesture also betrayed his anxieties about the future stability of the church community and the power of his own authority. Bjork likely would have felt normal uncertainty about the future of his congregation as he tried to establish a strong, stronger community of Christians in the still remote outpost. Yet, recent experiences during the planning and construction of the church had already conditioned his outlook. When, the, when building the church, Bjork noted that there had been many oppositions, his words. In deciding on a location for the new church, there were disagreements and protests, especially among those who would need to cross a river to attend services. Neighboring congregant John, John Stalkup had made a generous donation of land ab abutting the church in order to accommodate the building and the burying yard, but Bjork's subsequent attempts to pur purchase an additional larger tract of land from Stalkup to serve as a glebe house to support the pastor was frustrating. Stalkup seemed several times to change his mind on the terms of the sale. Another congregant who originally volunteered to oversee the church's construction was released for incompetence, and later he stole the church's bell. Clearly, when Bjork's West Wall asked, if God is with us, who can be against us, he truly wondered. Anxious that God alone might not prevent forces against them, Bjork used his metal inscriptions to evoke the political authority of nearly everyone who could be mustered for service, quite literally throwing everyone against the wall, including again, George III, the King of England, William Penn, the proprietor, the vice governor, William Markham, the deceased King of Sweden, Charles XI, the pastor himself, and of course, his trump card, who was God. To gaze up at Old Swede's walls today and consider these 324-year-old inscriptions, we might better sense the distance and the temporal space between now and then. Even back in 1851, an early Wilmington antiquarian named Elizabeth Montgomery gazed at length at the old iron letters and noted that, quote, from these relics, a thrilling voice has sounded, for it repeats the story of the past. It makes one feel that some ancient sanctity rests here. Today, the old iron inscriptions enhance the feeling of historical ambiance that pervades the old Swedes grounds, placing the visitor somewhere between the past and present. And I'd argue that many of the less formal inscriptions and historic graffiti achieve the same effect. For example, a close examination of each elevation of Old Swedes, including the former exterior walls that are now enclosed, but visible inside the abutting 18th century porch additions, reveals many wall stones that feature large rubbed initials. I call these builder stones. The stones shown here, going clockwise from top left, read JC, EF, KV, and JB. And yes, the B is backwards. I also want to point out here, the J's look like I's with a line through them. You'll see more of that later. Um, but those are J's in the 18th century. The similarity in style of these suggests that some or all of them may have been inscribed around the same time. A semi-collective act performed by people with a strong connection to the building. Many of these inscribed stones may be builder signatures. Inscriptions left by masons, workers, and or congregants who played a role in the church's construction. It was common practice until at least the mid-19th century for builders to sign masonry buildings in brick or stone with their names or initials and often a date, similar to painting signing a finished work of art. 
This is very common with brick buildings in the 1700s and the first half of the 1800s, especially here in the Mid-Atlantic. This practice, I should note, is still common in less formal forms with many modern plasterers and painters and other contractors who often sign their work, though often out of sight. At Old Swedes, there is at least one confirmed builder signature, though it does not date to the original construction of the church. And this might suggest the other builder stones are also from 18th century renovation. Though difficult to read, high up on the face of the South Porch, Cornelius Hines, an area mason, signed and dated his work, 1762, which I made the 1762 larger at the bottom. I know this is difficult to read. Like the Heinstone, builder signatures were often placed high above the ground, even at the second story. This is sometimes a sign that they were on scaffolding or a ladder working on the building when they signed it, but also a sign that they wanted to make sure their signatures were out of reach of vandals. Indeed, many of the initial stones on the walls of Old Swedes are located high above ground level, essentially hiding in plain sight. For example, scratched initials can be seen on a stone high above the doorway inside the Northwest porch, and another set of initials are located on a cornerstone placed about 10 feet above ground on the northwest corner of the building. Both are several feet higher than even a tall person like myself could comfortably reach, showing that they were either marked by someone at an elevated position on the building, or alternatively, they were pre-marked on the ground before they were set into the wall. If many of these stones are indeed builders or contractor signatures, they mark a moment when a craftsman or invested congregant permanently abetted his or her identity into the church's walls. This large stately stone building was likely the finest that many of them had ever created, and they may have seen their work here as an opportunity to elevate their status as respectable builders. As such, their signature on the wall acted as both signature and as advertising. The last inscription type I'll discuss for Old Swedes Church might be the most well-known to visitors there. Two sets of double doors in the south porch, which lead directly into the sanctuary, are almost completely covered in carved graffiti. This combined volume, density, and age of the door graffiti here places it among the most prolific examples of surviving historic graffiti in the Mid-Atlantic. The doors almost serve as a de facto visitor's log from the early 19th century. Both sets of double doors feature scores of incised names, initials, dates, and other figures, totaling at least 375 distinct examples. In fact, the markings are so numerous and often nearly indecipherable that it took me over five hours just to photograph them all and then another six hours to create a spreadsheet to try to document and list their content. Based on the roughly 120 examples that contain dates, it is clear, quite clear that the majority of the graffiti probably occurred between 1825 and 1842. This is unsurprising since it is exactly the time period when the congregation decided to move from the aging church to a new stylish new chapel downtown, in downtown Wilmington. The church was essentially abandoned during most of the 1830s. And as you can see here, when it was portrayed in an 1842 painting, it had holes in the roof, broken windows, and was in pretty rough condition. Yet the neglect and abandonment of old Swedes cannot alone explain the frenzy of graffiti activity that happened just during those decades. It only demonstrates the increased opportunity for such acts. But there was something else at play here, a dynamic that is even more important to fully understand those graffiti doors. I've determined that the abandonment of Old Swedes Church coincided with a very strong spike in graffiti making and other public defacing uh, in public spaces that emerged in the United States during the first third of the 1800s. Dated graffiti I've encountered and documented elsewhere also tends to show a spike in activity during the 18-teens, 20s, and 30s. And remarkably, a few newspaper reports from the period even indicate a widespread surge of graffiti and vandalism. In fact, the increase in graffiti in American cities during the 1820s and 30s was apparently a trend that many contemporary observers found disturbing. In 1836, coinciding exactly with the largest flurry of graffiti at Old Swedes, the public ledger newspaper in Philadelphia called for the replacement of wooden benches in Washington Square in Philadelphia with iron ones, complaining that, quote, no wooden seats, however beautiful or highly ornamented, would be safe from the whittling propensity that appears wherever English or American blood flows. A Frenchman would as soon think of breaking the lamps or cutting down the trees in a public place as of cutting or defacing the seats. But an Englishman or American 
and especially the latter, would think that to whip out a penknife and scrawl his name or initials or some vile image upon a seat would be as natural and as innocent as to sit upon it. Few of our public places are free from this outrage upon propriety. None of our churches and very few of our legislative halls have escaped, end quote. Around the same period, in an article on politeness in America, perhaps the same editor fumed that, quote, the habit we have of cutting and defacing every fixture that is penetrable to steel is so universal and so abominable that it deserves to be scourged out of us by a pestilence or a famine, end quote. To essayists like this, there was a serious social problem in the young United States, perhaps even unique to America, involving the widespread propensity, or habit, as he put it, of whittling, cutting, and defacing any vulnerable surface in both public and private spaces. The problem was so serious, in fact, that one editorial called it an American vice and a national sin, one that proved, quote, the absence of the elements of a great and lofty character and a want of delicacy and refinement in America. To these observers, the propensity to graffiti was poss possibly symptomatic of a more serious social and cultural problem happening in the young nation. Disdain for vandals and graffitis was widespread and at times quite passionate. The behavior of the property defacers at this time was described as vile, sacrilegious, outrageous, indecent, mischievous, wanton, and bad, while the vandals themselves were called rascals, delinquents, miscreants, and blackguards. Indeed, many felt that the graffiti epidemic was an embarrassment to the American nation. Some newspaper essayists compared the manners of Americans, and often Englishmen, unfavorably to their French and to their German counterparts, especially in relation to the habit of marking and vandalizing. Period reports reveal occasional hints about the actual content of the graffiti observed at this time. By far, the most common surviving graffiti are signatures of the graffitis, containing initials or a first initial and surname, or even a full name, sometimes with the date of the signature added below or to the right. But human figures, pictures, lengthy inscriptions, or geometric designs sometimes accompany these uh, signature graffiti, though they are far less common numerically than names and dates. Vulgar or pornographic graffiti was, believe it or not, fairly frequent. For example, cemetery structures in Saybrook, Connecticut, had in the early 1830s been covered with Latin inscriptions and, quote, obscene figures. At Joseph Bonaparte's estate in New Jersey, the observatory door was marred with, quote, low ribaldry and taproom jests. This sort of lowbrow, graphic, and profane graffiti was probably far more common than surviving evidence would indicate, since the most offensive content was more apt to be removed by refinishing or replacement, though I have now documented hundreds of pornographic graffiti, especially in New England meeting houses. Pretty much everything was vulnerable to graffiti in the early 1800s. Trees, signs, artwork, monuments, benches, and buildings were common targets of graffitists. But several period articles suggest that, sadly, even gravestones and tombs were often graffitied. And sadly, they still are today, I should throw in. A notice in a Salem, Massachusetts newspaper in 1823 threatened conviction for anyone, quote, entering, defacing, or in any way injuring the burying grounds or the tombs, stones, monuments, or graves. The newspaper report noted that even the famous Mount Auburn Cemetery in Massachusetts, the beautiful, the cherished, the holy, as it described it, had, quote, not escaped the sacrilegious hands of the vandals. In a fictional story in a Philadelphia newspaper in 1840, a character complained to a friend, quote, once I was caught at what, what they called defacing the tombstones. And what, Gus, do you think they called defacing? Well, it was writing Suki Saunders' name under the heads of some of the cherubins. The same year, the New York Herald published the rules and regulations for the famous Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, including the prohibition of, quote, writing upon, defacing, or injuring any monument, fence, or other structure. In 1855, in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, a man was jailed for, quote, defacing a tombstone in the graveyard. The Baltimore newspaper reporting that case hoped the conviction would, quote, serve as an effectual warning against all kinds of depredations in such sacred places. This problem sheds much light on the likely conditions faced at Old Swede's Church uh, Cemetery during the same period. Since trees, signs, benches, statues, and even gravestones were so frequently graffitied, it's unsurprising that buildings, large, immobile, and ever-present, 
were highly marked as well. News reports from the antebellum period, as well as surviving graffiti, show that nearly every type of structure, whether houses, churches, commercial structures, or civic buildings, was frequently marked with graffiti during that era. You'll recall the public ledger had noted that none of our churches and very few of our legislative halls had escaped the American impulse to carve. In 1823, in New Bern, North Carolina, someone had been, quote, defacing the brickwork and front columns of the new Episcopal Church prompting a $10 reward offered to anyone who would help uh, to help to capture the culprit. In 1844, a Baltimore school board published the Rules of Student Conduct, the second one warning that, quote, students guilty of defacing or otherwise injuring the building or other property of the commissioners shall pay for the same. As you can imagine, school desks were always a target. The market buildings in Philadelphia were frequent victims of defacement, prompting officials to pass an ordinance in 1848 banning loitering at the houses and hopes that it would, quote, prevent persons from injuring or defacing the said market houses. The same year, the public ledger suggested that, leg or the same, same year that the public ledger had suggested legislative halls could not escape the graffiti scourge, the frontier state of Indiana was finishing construction of a grand state house in Indianapolis at a cost of $68,000. A traveler visiting the building just a few years later in the 1850s still marveled at the building's massive dome its impressive piazza, its Doric columns, but less inspiring, a defensive sign in the entry, entryway warning of a, quote, $3 fine and imprisonment for carving or defacing this building. Perhaps for obvious reasons, doors and doorways seem to attract more graffiti than other areas of buildings. It makes sense since they are often recessed and out of sight and often made of wood. In busy public spaces, doorways also seem to have been common congregation spaces for young men. An 1836 editorial in the Public Ledger in Philadelphia complained of a rude custom that prevailed, quote, among young men of assembling at the doors of churches and staring at every female who enters or departs. Such idleness while hanging out in entryways certainly would have made doors more vulnerable to marking, if only from boredom. And for those who wish their graffiti to be noticed, doorways were prime targets, since they were high traffic areas, ensuring that the graffiti would be visible to most people as they passed in and out of the building. Perhaps for all of these reasons, doorway graffiti was common in the mid 19th century. For example, in Philadelphia in 1840, two boys were charged with, quote, cutting and defacing the door of a lady at 7th and Pine Street. Similarly, in Baltimore in 1842, 1848, two elusive and mischievous boys had regularly been, quote, scratching and defacing the door plates, et cetera, of houses on Baltimore Street and Broadway. A door had also been a major focal point for graffitius at Joseph Bonaparte's estate that I mentioned a few minutes ago in New Jersey, which had also so rudely experienced vandalisms of statues and other ornaments. In his garden, at some distance from the house, the door of an observatory was, quote, completely bespattered with all sorts of graffiti. A few years before, a Philadelphia newspaper actually listed, quote, defacing doors as one of the vandalism, uh, one form of vandalism used for, quote, gratifying spite or hostility against property owners. So with all of the above factors in mind, it's unsurprising that the two doorways in a recessed and hidden South Porch at Old Swedes attracted a huge amount of graffiti during the first half of the 19th century. I'm short on time, but I wanna quickly mention why I believe this major spike in American graffiti occurred in the 18 teens and 1820s, which is penmanship training. Notice the guidelines here that help form the top and bottom boundaries for the initials WR. And notice these stylized fonts with their serif lettering and the italicized Peterson that was carved in 1833. It's no coincidence, I argue, that the spike in graffiti aligns perfectly with the rise in compulsory education in the United States, and more specifically, with the rise of penmanship training. Suffice it to say, there was a proliferation of penmanship textbooks that were published across the US during the same time period. And you can clearly see that their lessons played out beyond the classroom with historical graffiti. Yet words and numbers are not all you'll find on the old Swedes doors. For example, this eagle, later partially covered by the initials MJR, is pretty skillfully rendered on one of the doors, and I showed a couple of hearts that someone created earlier. Yet there are no less than five buildings, a pair of roughly sketched twin houses, another rudimentary house with chimneys, 
a large mansion or maybe a castle, and a couple of drawings of what is clearly Old Swedes Church itself, which I should mention, I see in a lot of buildings where people drew pictures of the building where they were graffitiing. While this placement may have been the most efficient a way for graffiti car carvers to sign their work, um, several of the inscribers seem to have intentionally placed their initials inside of the house. Um, their intentions may have been subconscious, but it also might be a, a mistake to dismiss this as possibly people putting themselves inside, themselves inside heavenly mansions, entering the house of the Lord, uh, which was a pervasive uh, Christian concept well into the 19th century. Since these graffitis were literally standing at the doorways to God's house and also completely surrounded by gravestones and thus reminders of their own mortality, these drawings might have placed the inscriber into the symbolic heavenly mansions. This may have been, in fact, the perspective of, of Holy Trinity's reverend, John McCullough himself, since an 1842 uh, sermon of his, of his had ridiculed all the past graffitis who had, quote, sought a brief immortality by carving their names upon these doors. While these young loiters may have yearned for immortality, like most of their contemporaries, they could not have ignored the reality that their actions were actually criminal and possibly simple. A broadside, likely dating to the mid-1830s, was posted around the grounds of Old Swede's churchyard as a warning to those who might be tempted to leave their mark. It declared that, quote, all persons are prohibited under a penalty of five dollars from defacing the church or tombs by marking or cutting with knife, pencil, or otherwise. Reverend McCullough also later condemned those who had, quote, left memorials of their sacrilege and shame by irreverent and offensive words, sentences, and figures on the church's doors. Clearly, however, the threat or penalty of perjury was not enough to dissuade so many from leaving their mark on the symbolic doorway to heaven. The graffiti and markings I've shown at Old Swedes Church demonstrate how inscriptive practices, whether formal or informal, leave powerful evidence of past historical events and embody important social and cultural contexts. They tell specific stories, especially when more detailed historical information can be attached to them. With my remaining few minutes, I'm going to transition to a less formal look at a few historic graffiti and inscriptions I've encountered at other historical sites in Delaware including types of markings not found at Old Swede's church. Many of these I haven't fully researched, but collectively they provide a glimpse of some of the other graffiti that's out there waiting to be dis uh, discovered and studied, and they at least hint at the value they offer as potential historical documents. I'll be flipping through these very quickly due to time, so sorry for that in advance, um, but I'm happy to answer questions or return to slides later. So I want to start here with the John Luden House in Christiana, which was built in 1770. There's strong evidence of its build date due to the date stone at its foundation, which has a JL 1770. And again, I, I mentioned earlier how J's were often made to look like I's historically. So that's what you're seeing here. It's John Luden 1770. Um, but the J is just an I with a line through the middle. But my favorite graffiti here, and, and maybe some of my favorite graffiti I've ever documented, is on the parlor chimney stack paneling. Uh, you can see a patch there that was left unpainted by uh, previous owners, and I hope is still unpainted today. It's, it was many years ago when I documented this. But what we have here is a patch of exposed early pencil graffiti. And if you zoom in and enhance it, as I have here, the graffiti shows it, um, someone was jotting. And by the way, if you look at the height here, someone is standing there jotting this on the fireplace uh, wall paneling, essentially. It's right at the perfect height for someone of average height to be jotting while standing. And it appears to read two quarts of oats, one glass of gin, one mug cider, maybe a half mug of mold cider, and then another mug of cider. And you can see the prices apparently on the right so this literally appears to be a 200 year old bar tab. Um, there's no record of this house that I know of that, um, that it had served as a tavern historically. But when you look at this evidence left by this historic graffiti, again, just um, unexposed when I think some previous owners scraped paint and found this, um, it's pretty powerful evidence, I think. I mean, I think the two quarts of oats might even be to feed horses. Um, so it seems that this could have been a tavern historically. And we might only know that because of this historic graffiti at this building. Um, to jump much further south, this is the Hearns and Rollins Mill uh, near Seaford. Um, and 
at the bottom, you have an old barn turned garage. Inside there, in the rightmost stall, is a wall that's uh, partially covered in old whitewash, but it provides some other interesting records, though in a much later time period. If we look really closely at the planks on this wall, it seems the proprietor kept accurate records of truck servicing uh, right on the walls about 90 years ago. So this appears to be 1920s and 30s maybe, so about 100 years ago. Uh, there's, there's records here of oil changes and other work occurring um, during the Great Depression years, which I think makes this even more interesting. On the bottom right, you can see a Chevrolet was faithfully, faithfully serviced each New Year's Day. You can see it says January 1, and then it says ditto, ditto underneath the January 1, and the years 1933, 1934, 1935. So someone was regularly servicing this and writing the mileage each year uh, as they serviced probably trucks working the mill, um, multiple vehicles taking care of them and keeping the records right on the walls. And that's only preserved if that still exists um, with this historic graffiti. Uh, this is uh, Cochran Grange in Middletown. It's a large bank barn way in the back of the property. I eliminated a couple other things from this property just to show this barn for time. But um, this large bank barn contains a lot of graffiti, and some of it may never be explained, uh, including this John. Um, who was John? When was this carved? It would probably be almost impossible to figure this out unless you could locate a family member um, that we might attribute this to. But there is more intriguing graffiti at Cochran Grange Barn that I think is really neat um, and, and maybe would be more easy to research. Uh, here we have blue chalk drawing of what might be the act, actual Cochran Grange mansion. It looks like some kind of building with multiple sections, um, like a large, large house with an extension, who knows? And it seems to have been assigned by F. Paul Ross. That's just a guess. It just has the large R and a couple smaller letters maybe that um, are, are have, have lost the chalk. So it's hard to tell for sure, but research could probably turn up somebody local that made this drawing. But nearby is one of my favorite Delaware graffiti, another favorite of mine, a uh, huge painted ship. Um, this is several feet across and a few feet tall. Um, it's, it's, it's very large. Um, it has a ship with two masts, lots of rigging and sails, as well as a captain's wheelhouse. And you can see even the wheel uh, of the ship uh, there at the back. And next to it are the initials w, uh, WSD and an 80, which I think probably reveals who the creator was, those initials, and the 1880 date that it may have been uh, created. The 80 could mean something else. I don't know. Again, I've never researched this, but just a fascinating piece of graffiti um, at a place that was still mostly reachable by sailing vessels in the 18th and 19th century. And I should mention, ships are some of the most common graffiti across the entire East Coast. I've literally documented hundreds of ships and probably somewhere like 75 or 80 buildings now. Um, and I'll show a few more. I wish I had more time to discuss the significance of those ships. Um, here in Milton is a house in Milton where someone has preserved an old clabbered from the house uh, when it was recited uh, that has a rudimentary carving of a boat or a ship there. And they carved their address into another piece of clabbered and then they framed it up near their front door. So someone noticed it and thought it was worth preserving, which I think is really cool. And again, Milton was a shipbuilding town. Um, so it's it's really cool. Someone carved a ship on clabbards there. And again, you see this all over the place in um, coastal areas. At the parish house on the strand in Old Newcastle, if you look carefully, and look inside the door jam to the front door, there is a ship carved in that doorway on the jam paneling. Um, the paint makes it tough to see. I got the best picture I could with some raking lights, which is often my strategy for trying to capture these graffiti when they're hard to see. Um, but you could definitely see one, probably two sailing vessels carved inside this door jam. At Thomas Landing down in the Augustine area um, is a farm complex with uh, several outbuildings. And a barn there contains a door with a couple of sailing vessels carved into it. It might be hard to see at this scale, but I put the arrows there for you to, to see the ships that are carved in that door. Um, one of which looks like there was a plank replaced. Um, so only half the ship is there, which I think is interesting. So that was either replaced or they made the ships before they made the door out of the planks, which is also interesting. And as you can see, someone also carved probably initials WK, maybe a backwards D. I don't know the significance of the 18 if someone was starting to write a date or that's, you know, 1818, 20, uh, 1918, who knows? Uh, everyone or most people probably know uh, the John Dickinson Plantation near Dover. Um, many of you probably visited there. 
But down in the basement level, there's a door stored in the basement, which was apparently rescued from an old barn there. And that door contains two really nicely carved ships or schooners uh, and probably multiple other ones that are just really hard to see or kind of lost to time and faded away or been rubbed away. Um, and keep in mind, again, that this was accessible by water historically. And so people are carving what they see in these navigable waterways and interacting with ships probably every day as part of their existence. And that's what's so fascinating is people are recording what they see in their world around them. So they're, they're really records of a time and place that has since vanished. I should mention that same door contains what I call visitor graffiti, which we saw a lot of at Old Swedes Church. Someone with the initials WDW has carved um, their initials and wrote Philadelphia, um, abbreviated there, um, which is really common uh, for people to put the city they're from when they sign something in the 19th century. And I also wanted to mention, on my way out of the, the basement, I noticed this carving at, underneath the stairs leading down to the basement. Um, which the site manager at the time said that they had never noticed before and didn't know that anyone had noticed before. But clearly we have someone with the initials RS signing this building in 1841, um, so 180 years ago. Um, and, and I think it could be a record of someone who was a tenant farmer that occupied the building at that time or someone who worked there, maybe even a family member. I don't know the full history of the Dickinson Plantation. But again, um, intriguing that you might be able to locate someone with the initials RS from this time period associated with this building and see that they left their mark. So switching gears a little bit, um, let's move up to Hokesson to the Cox Phillips Agricultural Complex, where the house and barns have several different types of markings. But the one I really want to call your attention to here is the inside of a door leading to, uh, to the attic stairway. And that circular flower symbol you see on the right at an angle there is uh, often called daisy wheel or a hexafoil. Their meaning hasn't been fully proven. There's much debate about what these symbols meant and why people created them. I've actually written an article about it published in Historic New England, the magazine, about this. And I basically say I think there's a lot of explanations for them. But many believe they have protective intent. Um, this is called apotropaic, when someone carves something to keep away misfortune or evil. A lot of people call these witches marks, which is way overused. It uh, probably wasn't usually to keep out literal witches, um, but it's probably someone um, you know, using superstitious markings is what we would call it today to protect their space, kind of like the horseshoe over the door many are familiar with. Um, here you can see the, the symbol straight on and me demonstrating on the right how you can make these symbols. Um, by using a compass or a carpenter's dividers, uh, they're really quite easy to make in less than a minute. Um, a, a child can make them. And because of this, I do think some of them are playful doodles, not protection marks. Um, other people have pointed out that geometry like this was used when extrapolating like the proportions of buildings and angles for building. Some people believe that almost all of these are explained by builders using them to build. I think that's over argued. I really think there's a mixture of explanations for why these exist, but I have now documented scores of these, uh, maybe hundreds, uh, and they are on a lot of early American buildings, especially pre-Civil War era buildings. But you do find them in some later buildings including, for example, this is old St. Paul's Church in Odessa. Um, this is a um, daisy wheel that I found scratched into the brick on the facade. That's my son Preston when he was much younger and shorter, sadly, uh, pointing to it. But this church was built in 1852. And again, this is at a time when a lot of people say such superstitious practices and beliefs and witches, especially, right, would have faded away. But again, I think it's interesting that there's just one of these carved right on the facade near the corner of the building. Who's to say it didn't have some kind of blessing intent or spiritual intent? Maybe it's just a, a doodle. It's, it's hard to know. Speaking of Odessa, at the Corbett Sharp House, which was built in 1774, there are quite a few markings in a room that was once used as a kitchen, later I was told was even used as a schoolroom, and that paneling you see there on that fireplace wall does include some compass-drawn circular marks, like this variation of a daisy wheel um, that has maybe four petals, it's kind of incomplete. Um, there are also candle scorches on the fireplace mantle area here, which seem to be intentional, and I won't go into this, but that also has been attributed to apotropaic practices. So I think there is some evidence there could have been apotropaea happening here, people kind of blessing the building, protecting the building uh, from, from um, bad luck or whatever. But again, this also was apparently used as a kid's schoolroom for a while, and this could just be kids playing and doodling and making kind of like spirographs in modern times. 
Speaking of kids playing, uh, these initials with a 1777 date are also found in that room and are interesting because these would have been made just three years after the Corbett Sharp house was built. And so I think it's really interesting if that is true. Um, what does it say about, you know, what was acceptable marking practices on architecture and living spaces at this time? Also begs the question who made this, especially since it was a kitchen. Two decades later in the same room, someone named F. Knox carved their initials in 1796. And later in, it was infilled with paint or putty. That's why it's so easy to see with the lighter color still inside the inscription. Um, but again, I've, not, I've done no research to try to figure out who F. Knox may have been. But to transition to a more formal marking of names and dates, this is the Jehu Reed House in Little Heaven. Many of you know this was lost a few years ago, unfortunately. But Mr. Reed created a vernacular date stone way up on the wall by flipping two bricks on their side and carving his initials in the year 1868. This was a high style Italianate house, but really this date plaque he made was pretty vernacular and homemade, right? Which I, I find is fascinating. The Cook's Ulrich's house uh, in Port Penn, also demolished, something we like to do here in Delaware. Um, there was a kitchen edition there, and that kitchen edition contained a date brick where the arrow was pointing, and that contained J.A. for John Ulrich in the year 1780. Again, there's another one of those J's that looks kind of like an I. This tells us at least when that kitchen edition was probably added, during the Revolutionary War in 1780. I tried to save this brick when the house was demolished, but I couldn't get it out of the wall. Down near Seaford, the Cannon Maston house was also marked by family. A brick flipped on its side was carved with tools to read 1727, probably before the clay was fired. And near this, several members of the Cannon family left their initials near the doorway. You can see all the C's in those initials for the Cannon family. Most know of the Amstel House Museum in Old Newcastle. And next to that house where the arrow's pointing is a garden wall. And that wall contains a really neat signature brick that its initials seem to say J.C. And it says May of 1761 or 1767, I'm not quite sure. But I think I have reason to believe this brick was moved at one time, but I still think this is a really intriguing brick that deserves more research. But high above this, there's another type of marking in a bedroom window. It's a window etching at the Amstel House that reads, round, he round her ye angels, constant vigils keep, and guard fair innocence, her balmy sleep. So this may be a protective prayer for a child sleeping in the room, but I've also found this as an epitaph in the past. So it could also sadly be a prayer for a recently lost loved one. I've done no research again to, to bear this out, but I, I think one of the most poignant uh, markings I've encountered in Delaware. Across the street in the Kenzie Johns house, there's another window graffiti. In a rear bedroom in a window, it contains this inscription. And after puzzling over it a bit, I realized it was upside down. But after flipping it, the photo, we can see it was signed by Richard Seymour Rodney, born October 10th, 1882. And um, so who knows when this was done? It doesn't have the date it was signed, but the day the person was born. But that it's, I think it's, it's poignant, but also that it's flipped reveals that the window sashes here were probably taken out, cleaned, restored maybe at some point and reinstalled by someone that didn't realize that uh, this graffiti was there or they did and they didn't care. Um, just around the corner the next street over is a house on third street with yet another window etching old newcastle has the window etching so the historian jim meek sent me this photo years ago but it reads vicksburg surrendered july 4th 1863 which i love because of course gettysburg gets all the press but the vicksburg uh, victory out west would just a day later really opened up the west for the union so it was a really important battle and this could be someone learning of that that week uh, in the newspapers and carving a celebratory inscription another newcastle inscription on the strand so some of you may recognize this pretty well-known house down on the strand little newcastle with the ivory soap uh, painting but this used to be uh turn of the 20th century this was a dry goods store bolden store and here you can see David Bolden with the arrow and note behind him, the large store windows. Those store windows are still there. Um, and you can see where Mr. Bolden forever left his mark, the D Bolden on that window at, uh, etched in glass uh, and still there mo over a hundred years later, which I think is fascinating. So I see I just got a couple more minutes here, which is good timing because I wanted to wrap up with one more example. I had a bunch more in here that I cut out and actually they're still in the slideshow, but uh, I wanted to end with this one. I think 
uh, Old Droyer's Church in Odessa, because I think this is kind of good to highlight just how you find several of these different marking types I've shown um, in one, one site. So this, of course, is Old Droyer's Church, finished in 1773. And on the facade especially, I think there's actually about six of these bricks. Um, they're builder signatures. These are, I, I think, uh, people who worked, masons or builders who worked on building the church, all of whom signed their initials in the year 1773 as they completed the building. And uh, these, these line up in an almost symmetrical fashion on the facade of the very symmetrical building, which I think is interesting. Some of them are quite not perfect, but uh, it seems like they were intentionally trying to make this like flanking the doorway and at the corners of the building, setting these kind of makeshift builder signatures into the brick walls, which I find really, really interesting. And I'd really like to research and see if I can track down who at least some of these sig uh, signatories may have been. But these can be differentiated by later brick graffiti, right? So here's someone with the initial CHW that came along in 1899 and really deeply carved these bricks with their initials in the year. Um, it's surprising this one hasn't actually spalled and, and flaked out and fell apart, but it shows these bricks were well fired to hold up for 120 some years um, with, with that deep of cuts in them. But when we go inside, I should have showed an interior picture, but the pews are especially upstairs pews pew boxes are just covered in graffiti, not quite as dense as some of the meeting houses I've been, especially up in New England, but there's quite a bit of good graffiti here, including, as you see here, initials um, with signatures, December 27th, um, what year is it, is it 1846, I think, uh, so two days after Christmas, someone's in a chilly service there at Old old Joyers carving their initials. Um, there's carvings with people's um, you know, last name, Jefferson, including a backwards N, which I may have mentioned earlier, really common to see backwards letters. People literacy was, you know, different back then. People's levels of education was, was were varied and, and people got a lot of letters backwards. You see S's and N's and lots of letters, D's uh, frequently backwards. But again, here we have at least one ship. Um, and, and this one is interesting because it's actually cut off. They ran out of room apparently, uh, but someone carved a ship uh, pretty skillfully rendered. It's just not a full ship. And it and it's on an arc um, or an arch that I think is trying to be the world that someone's sailing the world um, is my interpretation of this. Who knows uh, if I'm wrong there, but seems to be what someone was, was trying to indicate. There's also several buildings and I didn't have time to put all of them in here, but um, you see houses, a couple of buildings. I think maybe someone making an attempt at drawing Old Droyer's Church itself. Um, but I, I found at least five building carvings here, I think. I found a couple of different, again, compass-drawn circular marks, or this might have been done with a race knife or, or what's called a timber scribe, where you, you poke it in, you can see the dots, and then you twist it, and it makes a circle with, with two different points. Again, is this apotropaic or just someone doodling? Does it mean the Trinity? Who knows? I have no idea, but you find these circular symbols in a lot of historic buildings. There's a few drawings of people. This might be the most skillfully rendered, believe it or not. I see tons of this in lots of other sites. Um, really interesting stuff. Men, women, preachers, uh, Native Americans. You see a lot of, of um, characters of people. Um, this is one in Old Droyers. This one I think is pretty interesting because it seems someone later with pencil graffiti, um, which you really don't see a lot of until the, the Victorian period, late 1800s, seems someone put 1776 and 1876. Um, so I think this was done possibly during a centennial celebration, the 100th anniversary of the United States. A lot of those kind of celebrations and 4th of July celebrations were held in meeting houses and churches. So I think someone may have been commemorating the U.S. centennial here by writing 1876 and 1776. And lastly, um, one of the more unique uh, inscriptions, uh, two old droyers probably, the church leadership carved pew numbers directly into the seats all over this church, which I find fascinating. They probably used a timber scribe like I was talking about that can make the circular parts. You can see the little dot in the middle of the five and the dots in the middle of the eight um, to make those circular circular portions, but also um, straight lines carved with uh, probably the, the scoop part of that tool, maybe a chisel, who knows. But I find it really interesting because it seems like um, they were willing to go ahead and carve up their new pew seats um, to impose order upon the congregation. So they did that themselves. But it, it seems like that probably encouraged later congregants unintentionally encouraged them to engage in disorder, uh, disorderly conduct with their own pen knives by, by later carving up the church. 
So I see we're at 730, so I'll close with that. But I just simply want to add that you can imagine how much research and interpretive potential lies with so many of these markings that I've shown tonight. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. These markings show human action, but they also show human sentiment, right? And so this is really just the tip of the iceberg. I encourage people to keep an eye out for these kind of things when they're out and about or touring historic buildings. I'd love it if people sent me stuff they see. But do let site administrators or property owners know if you spot something somewhere, make sure they're aware of it, because I truly believe these are valuable historical documents that um, people should be aware of in the buildings and really try to dig in and see if they can at least interpret what these markings may be telling us about how people use these buildings in the past. And I will end with that. Thank you guys for listening, and I'm happy to answer questions if anyone has any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. That was really, really interesting. And yeah, it's just amazing the the number of graffiti that you've that you've come across and the photos are awesome. We do have quite a few questions in here. So let's see. Okay, so as a person who has restored an older home and still lives there. Any thoughts on where to look for possible graffiti in our home? That's a great question. So houses are tough because um, they get renovated, right? And it wasn't really until I started studying historic preservation professionally about 15 years ago that I started realizing just how much even quote unquote historic houses um, have had their material fabric restored, renovated, replastered, repaneled, sanded down. Um, so a lot of historic houses that I think had a lot of graffiti written in plaster, but then later painted over the plaster cracks and the plaster gets replaced, um, carved into paneling. Um, a lot of times that was seen as unsightly and and, and, and and so people got rid of the graffiti. So in houses, um, unless you're lucky, it really is the spaces that are less apt to be renovated like um, basements, attics, if you happen to look out and have historic windows where people could have etched things, um, th those are the best places to look. If it happens to be a brick house um, or even in a, you know, an older house that has clabbered walls, um, look, look carefully in the wood, look carefully at the bricks and look for scratchings. Stairways, for whatever reason, often have carvings and places near windows, especially attics or upstairs bedrooms. Because back then they didn't have electric light. So windows were where people would congregate and carve where they could see. So um, hopefully that answers the question. Uh, it, meeting houses are great, the really well preserved ones, because they often have um, a huge amount of unchanged interiors out of just tradition and maybe cost savings. But houses far more frequently have been renovated, restored, and have probably lost a huge amount of the graffiti that was once there. Oh, that's interesting. Let's see what else we have here. So, okay. Um, so if you find an example of graffiti, but it doesn't have a date, um, are there any other clues that you can use to identify the significance or maybe date graffiti? Um, so this person's home dates to 1706, and there are some old graffiti initials in the wooden alley door. Wow. Yeah, that's, I'd love to see that. Uh, yeah, so it's really tough, as I said early in the talk, um, unless there's a date with it, you almost never can really date historic graffiti. So the next closest thing um, is, well, first of all, you have to look at the material fabric, right? It's um, terminus post quem, to use the archaeological concept, right? Is, is if, if you know a door went on, or there was a renovation that happened, or a wall was built at a certain time, it cannot be before that. But then I go to usually the font, so to speak, is what we would call it, the lettering, the styling of the lettering. And by looking at those penmanship guides, you can see when various types of writing were popular, like the serif stuff, the italicized stuff, it evolves over time. But that's really imprecise because first of all, there might be decades, the same kind of lettering is popular, but then a person who learned to write that way when they were a teenager may continue to write that way later in life. So it really could be 50 or 60 years that person still wrote that way. Though I will say most historic graffiti from my studies and the evidence I'm seeing was done by people ages 10 to maybe 25. I really think it's an adolescent thing, a young person thing. And so sometimes if you could figure out who the initials might belong to, a previous resident 
or worker in the house um, in looking at the style of the, the writing, um, you can at least narrow down and get an idea and, and speculate. And I'm always happy to weigh in on my gut sense on these kind of things when people send me stuff. So I'd be happy to look at it. Awesome. That's actually perfect because um, they are willing to send you a photo. So I don't know, Michael, if you'd be comfortable sharing maybe your email address. Um, it, maybe others have, have evidence you'd be willing to look at as well. Yes, I will. Um... Can I share it? I see host and panelist, but I'm in the chat. Oh, no, you're not giving the option for everyone? That's weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, but, my email, here. Yeah. But, but my email address is simply M-J-E-J, -E so Michael John Emmons Jr. is what that stands for, M-J-E-J, -E at sign U-D-E-L dot E-D-U. So that's University of Delaware abbreviation dot edu. So mjej at udel dot edu. Awesome. And I also responded um, in your Q&A box to that question with Michael's email address as well. So let's see, I've got more coming in. Oh, okay. This, I think this one is fitting with your, with your closing slide here. Um, can you imagine a can you imagine a future preservation movement, say 50 years from now, where we document and try to preserve contemporary graffiti that's spray painted in public spaces? Not only can I imagine it, but it's already happening. Um, of course, I think Banksy has single-handedly made people look at graffiti differently as um possible valuable works of of art. And uh trying to think of where it was, there was a building. I think New York City somewhere, maybe even Brooklyn, there was a building recently that a developer was going to demolish. And I believe um, there was an outcry because it was a huge kind of ground zero nexus for a lot of graffiti artists and taggers to sign, uh, had layers and layers. And it was seen as like this like cultural mecca almost for graffiti artists. And so um, there was a huge outcry and I think an effort to get that designated to prevent its demolition. I can't remember how it played out, uh, to be honest with you, but it's it's already happening. People are starting to look around. But this this raises really good questions, right? Um, when graffiti is destruction, when it's transgressive, when people are literally damaging other people's property by spray painting, especially something that's so um, in your face and, and damaging and ugly to a lot of people. Um, when do we cross the line, though, where we can appreciate that as art or something worth preserving, right? Because most of the graffiti I'm showing you, or a lot of it tonight, was at one point transgressive that you saw lots of people were upset about at the time and felt like it was the body politic of the young United States was rotting and the country might fall apart because we have all these young, you know, um, awful people that are willing to carve up the public spaces and other people's buildings. So, um, so there is a debate that I'm not really a part of. I think right now, um, other people who especially study modding, modern tagging culture and graffiti and trying to wrestle with that question more than I have of like, at what point does it become quote unquote historic? And at what point does it warrant historic preservation? And I think a lot of people, um, if you look at it, um, in, in the lens you're talking about, I think a lot of people will come to appreciate that some graffiti, if it isn't destructive, or doesn't completely ruin the aesthetics of a place, um, if it's well done or interesting, may be worth keeping. I mean, think about Alcatraz, um, which was taken over during the American Indian movement, um, can't remember what year, late 60s, maybe 1970, um, and, and they spray painted Red Power and some things like that on Alcatraz, where you arrived by boat. Uh, luckily, that has been preserved, or at least still was the last I knew. And I'm sure at one point that was seen as really destructive vandalism um, as part of this protest. But luckily, it was some, I think someone must have realized it's it's possible historic value. And as far as I know, it's still there on Alcatraz Island. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it's been a couple of years since I've been, but I do remember seeing it. So, well, thanks. That's super, super interesting. Let's see, go through our other questions here. We've got quite a few. Okay, so this question is sort of pointing out that some graffiti is pretty simple and was done quickly, but 
Um, other examples look expertly done, um, careful composition of the font and real craftsmanship that must have taken some time. Um, I guess, why do you think there's such a variety? Um, and also, how were they, if for the more complex examples, how do you think they were able to spend so much time um, <laughs> doing it? I mean, especially, I mean, I'm thinking like in church or without anybody knowing. Yeah, that's a great question. So obviously they had way less social media and distractions and Netflix and Hulu, right? So this is at a time when entertainment was was simpler. People had to entertain themselves more on their own and and people uh, spent more time outside. But yeah, I, I think I think a lot of this was created by younger people, often out loitering, hanging out in outbuildings, young workers, farmhands, hanging out in barns. Um, and, you know, it's a rainy day. You can't go out in the field and, man, you know, harvest the hay or crops or plant or whatever. What are you doing? There might be some other chores, but maybe you end up lingering around the barn, just, um, you know, kicking around, burning time. And so, um, and this is at a time when paper wasn't as available and was expensive, right? And so I just think there was more of an impulse. You saw a blank space. You have a pen knife you're carrying with you all the time, which most young men did, Um and, and people made the time to just create something. And um, I, I think the variety and the skill level is, is, first of all, just people's skill levels as artists. But I think sometimes you have children really making a crack at something and what are pretty childish looking doodles. And I've seen a lot of that stuff, I think was probably done by someone younger than 10. Um, and then you see stuff you know was done by someone either a very skilled teenager or someone older. Um, I think of the ships I've seen. I've seen so many beautifully rendered ships that have incredible proportions, incredible sails, mass rigging, where really so only someone that was familiar with ships, maybe had worked on ships, had internalized what they looked like, how they were designed, or they're literally looking at them out across the water. And in some cases, especially after the 1830s or so, I suspect as print culture becomes more and more common and people start having magazines or copies of newspapers laying around that have wood wood uh, engravings as illustrations. Maybe sometimes people were actually drawing off a picture, looking off a picture, but um, but it, there, you're right. There is a huge spectrum of quality, but um, I've documented dozens of pictures that are just amazing, like like artwork. Um, they, they truly, whether like actual accurate renderings of something or really well done caricatures of people, um, it, it's it's pretty neat. That's that's super fun. Yeah, I can imagine finding like a caricature of somebody. <laughs> and and to the the point about the churches, you do see a lot of this in churches, and they're sitting there through literally hours of sermons, hours of lectures. They had a lot of time on their hands, and they would just sit there. I think I think I think they would return to their pew and and continue the pictures sometimes in subsequent weeks. I think some of this graffiti was was created over time. Um, you see where people added to other people's pictures, clearly done in different hands. So that's one of the cool things about studying historic graffiti is uh, it's sometimes additive and shows multiple hands at work. That's awesome. I don't I don't think I'd ever like guess that, but I mean, it makes total sense, right? Yeah, you happen upon something and you're like, oh, let me put my mark on this too. Yeah. So let's see. So this question is talking about, um, I guess there's an 1860s covered bridge at Fair Hill um, and it's covered with graffiti. A lot of it goes back to the 19th century. Um, have you ever seen that bridge or, or examined that? Yeah, I think I was just there last summer. If it's the one that's not, you can't travel anymore, it's next to the highway. Um, I stopped there with my kids when we were going to a hike and sometimes they get impatient as I walk around such structures looking for graffiti. So I, I think it was a rushed inspection, but I do think I have some cell phone pictures of that cover bridge uh, graffiti. And, and my memory of it is I thought a lot of it seemed to be like late 20th century. So I'm glad to hear someone saying there's definitely early stuff. And maybe I found some of that, I can't remember. But um, it's good to know it's there so I could return maybe without my kids and spend more time documenting that bridge. Cover bridges were absolutely gathering places um, where people carved a ton of graffiti. But unfortunately, there's so few cover bridges that survive. Um, but I've seen a couple up in New England um, that are absolutely covered in really old graffiti that are great. So, so thank you for that tip. Let's see. So I think we are coming up on our time here, but I did want to 
just one, maybe one more kind of question or comment, um, but just cool. I did, I did um, answer it and it, so it's in the Q&A so you can see it, but just somebody acknowledging that they met you um, years ago in old Newcastle when you were starting out um, and just congratulating you. Um, it's really awesome to see what you've found so far. So I think that's pretty neat. Um, and also uh, an interesting comment. So I guess um, the late, I'm gonna butcher this pronunciation. Uh, so excuse me, Paul Rodebaugh from Chester County, Pennsylvania. Um, when asked about the graffiti on the benches and the walls at Birmingham Meeting House, responded that whenever a church or meeting or church was affiliated with the school, there is graffiti. So I guess maybe <laughs> what you're noticing too, they kind of go hand in hand, um, but that's just kind of a so fun. Young, if young people are around, there's graffiti. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I've never been inside the Birmingham Meeting House or school, but I've looked in the windows and I can see graffiti. So I'd love to go go in those buildings at some point. Oh, that, well, yeah. Hopefully, I don't know. Maybe there's a maybe there's a connection here. If if <laughs> reach out to Michael if you've got a connection. Awesome. Well, thank you, Michael, again so much. This was super interesting. There are tons of comments just about great presentation and and thanking you. So I know everybody else agrees as well. Um, I just want to, well, I guess I'll give you the the last couple minutes or two. Is there anything you wanted to add before I close this out tonight? No, I just want to thank everyone for coming. I always love talking about this stuff. And this was a chance for me to break open my um, hard external hard drive and, and, and really go through a lot of the Delaware stuff I've documented but haven't looked at for years. And so this was really enjoyable for me. And I, I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, I appreciate everyone hanging in. I know I talked fast a lot, but somehow just squeezed it into an hour. Uh, but but this was enjoyable, and I thank you to everyone for attending. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. And yeah, again, thank you to everybody for attending. Before you go, um, I just want to invite you, if you want to open up your chat, I've been popping links in there, and I just want to call your attention to the last two links I posted. So one is the registration for our June webinar that I mentioned at the top of this event. Um, so again, it's called, Is This Original? Tips for Investigating Historic Architecture. It's free, just like this one, June 27th. You can register using that link. Um, but you can also, of course, go to PDI's website or check us out on social media and find information about the event there as well. And then uh, lastly, the second to last link I posted is actually a survey. It's very brief. Um, but if you enjoyed this webinar and kind of similar events, we're looking for your input on what topics you might want, you might be interested in and that we should consider for future webinars and events. So it'd be really great to get your input if you'd be willing. Again, brief survey in the chat. There's a link for you there. Um, and yeah, again, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And we hope to see you at the next one.